Well, thank you so much for coming on today, Boris. It's really great to have people from a range of different perspectives on the podcast and, um, you know, you coming from a practice in Asia um, and also working from not just a design background, but also a bit of an engineering and even manufacturing background. It's going to be really awesome to have you on to, yeah, to share, share your perspective. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So anyone who doesn't know Boris, um, Boris has, has had an interesting background. You worked overseas in, in Europe to start your career off. Is that right? Uh, that's correct. I first started in uh, Switzerland. Yep. And my last job in Europe was in uh, Germany. Yeah. Okay. And then, yeah, then from there you had a pretty big change moving into Asia and then eventually moving through what consultancy work and working with like consumer electronics in Asia and then moving into your own man manufacturing practice now, which is amazing. Right. So I moved to, uh, I'll just give you a quick background. Yeah, that'd be so awesome. I, I moved to Shanghai, I think in 2006 or 2007, um, started working for a really big company called ZTE. So they're a mobile communications company. And uh, in those days, industrial design for mobile phones was actually fun. You know, we had flip phones, mm -hmm. car phones, uh, LCD screens started getting bigger. Uh, there was a lot of things going on with uh, material explore exploration. Um, it was a really, really fun time. Before, mm -hmm. of course, you know, once the iPhone came out, things kind of became uh, standard um, ID wise. But that was mm -hmm. a really fun time. And it was also a great learning experience because I worked for a really, really big Chinese company that was also doing their manufacturing all over China, not just in mm -hmm. uh, Senza. And I had some insight to their manufacturing and it was really, really fascinating because I couldn't believe how cheap you could manufacture for. But of course, these companies have high volume so they can achieve uh, low unit cost. But just to give you an example, I remember we were doing a phone for Southeast Asia. And I think the production cost on that phone was like at seven, eight US dollars, like a really, really low budget. Yeah, it's a low budget phone, you know, just mm. a simple black and white LCD screen, no color, but just absolutely amazing how they can get this, uh, achieve this low cost. Mm. So I did that for a while in, uh, in Shanghai. I loved living there. And um, it was also a culture shock, to be honest, because the way Chinese work is very different than the way you would work in Europe. Mm. So in Europe, things are more structured. Um, I would say also more quiet. Whereas in China, things get chaotic, things get loud. And, you know, there's a cultural difference. There's also a language barrier. So I think the, at that time when I was working there, it was total madness. But it was mm. a great uh, learning experience. Yeah. No, it must have been a really interesting experience. Um, just look to, moving back to one of the things you said, you mentioned that you you see like the past, how they were getting to like flip phones and things like that is like an innovative time in ID and you know, maybe now not being so innovative. Is that is that um but as we've moved more towards like minimalism opposed to like striving for technological innovation in these fields? Yeah. Is that kind so, of where you come uh, from? So yeah, so the design, um, let's let's put it like this, the user experience for mobile phones just became more simple. Yeah, so yeah. You, yep. So I think Apple, if I'm not mistaken, mistaken, Apple was the first company to get rid of the physical keyboard on a mobile yep. device. Yeah. And it turns out it works great. It works really mm. good. And yep. back then, HTC, uh, HTC and BlackBerry, those were the two big brands for uh, having a mobile phone with a keyboard. Yep. Um, so I think the user experience um, just eliminated those uh, mm. components we just don't need them i know some brands today are still trying to bring back the keyboard mm. uh unsuccessfully and things yeah. have moved towards apps so back in those days there were no apps so mm. some people don't even know that like uh, for example my daughter when i tell her hey when we grew up there were no apps you know you just had a phone <laughs> <laughs> and that was it there was no gaming there was no internet connectivity mm. so i think uh, that led to a huge change. And that also led to the rise of uh, software development, app development. Yeah. So, and even, I suppose, uh, the move away from um, more hardware focused design opposed to more software and like, um, yeah, like having the functionality of the phone comp comprised in the software, kind of that, right. that mentality. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, that's awesome. Um, maybe just to continue on from there, uh, 
maybe just continue to give a bit of a background, like what led you up to the experiences that brought you to who you are today? And like, what are those key experiences that really you feel like paved you, paved the the career sure. that you have now? Yeah, that'd be awesome. Like I said, I lived in uh, Shanghai until 2010. Then I moved yep. to Taiwan. I started working for an OEM in uh, Taiwan. Yep. Um, I was designing coffee machines. Okay. Um, capsule machines, pod machines, um, so back then in 2010, they were one of the largest uh, manufacturers for uh, household appliances. And their ID office was based in Taipei. Their manufacturing was in uh, China. And that was an awesome experience because their manufacturing mm -hmm. facility in uh, South China was in Xiamen, not in Shenzhen. Um, it, was, it was gigantic. I think it was probably one kilometer long because all their suppliers were on the same land. Mm. So if you needed something, let's say you needed a mock-up, you just jump on a bicycle and you just ride to the mock-up supplier in, this, in the same compound. It's you crazy. need screws. You just take your bicycle and just... So it's all within the same co compound. And what I did was, when I was there, I had access to the bill of materials. Mm. So with cost, with cost of goods. So I was able to see, okay, this screw costs this much, plastic parts are this much. And I was like really fascinated how cheap it is but i was also mm. fascinated by why did you choose this and not this part so for example um i think there was a leakage on one of the machines and the solution to that was to use a different kind of um rubber what do you call it a hose not a hose a rubber grommet yeah yeah but that that if so if they choose a better one the cost gets too high so they mm. cannot shoot that. So I started to learn how engineers think on why they choose certain components. Most of, most of the time it's to save cost, mm. but sometimes that can go the wrong way. Sometimes you're saving cost in the wrong area and you'll ship a product that's not gonna last, you know, the first yep. six months. So I started to learn about the complexity of actually bringing a product like from prototype stage through manufacturing. Hmm. And it's it's really painful because even when you have the golden sample for a prototype, that doesn't mean your production is going to go smooth. Because hmm. when you go to production, you're using production material. So it's important that for any hardware startup, for example, it's important that you get your prototyping as close as possible to your manufactured version hmm. as possible yep. with the same components from the, from the suppliers you intend to use. Yep. Okay. Um, so yeah, I was really fascinated by that. So I did that for a couple of years. And then uh, after I finished that, I was like, okay, I'm done working for people. I'm gonna become an independent designer. So I started my own uh, iPhone case brand. I did that for around uh, maybe 15 months, realized it's a really, really difficult business. You need high volume to be profitable. Mm. And I just continued doing uh, ID work for other companies. And it was all the way until 2018, I think, I was doing ID work. And then I started getting more requests for engineering work. Hey, can you do the mechanical engineering? Can you do uh, electrical? So mechanical is, is not an issue. I can manage that because it's, I think when, you, when your background is from ID, you can understand mm. mechanical engineering. But yep. what you cannot understand is electrical engineering. That's yeah. just a whole world for itself along with firmware software. So I get started getting more requests. So I had a friend here in uh, Taipei um, who happens to be a mechanical engineer and a, an electrical engineer. So I asked him if he wants to join. He said, sure, why not? So we grew the company from two people to around 22 people within oh. two, two and a half years. Mm. That's and, rapid growth. Uh, so, yeah, it was a really, really, really uh, fast growth. And we also decided to do our own uh, final assembly testing and packaging. So we have a small uh, assembly line, 20 minutes from our office here in uh, downtown Taipei. Yep. And that's where we assemble uh, our products. We do the testing, we do packaging and so forth. So that's what, that's what led me to Mate Studio. So we're an end-to-end -end development company today. And we've also added a software development. Yeah, well. Okay. Do you, um, if you looked back, you know, 10 years ago, would you have saw where you are today? Or do you think that it's kind of just, you just followed the the breadcrumbs that have been given to you along the way? 
Mm. Well, it's a good question. So when I was doing the iPhone case, I realized, okay, even a simple thing like iPhone case can, can get mm. complicated. There, there are yep. always some small issues that come up. So back then I was thinking, oh my God, if I would, were to do like electronics, what a headache that would be. I'm never going to do that. Mm. Because just, you know, getting the iPhone case right was so time consuming. And uh, we had a lot of challenges in that as well. So my thinking back then was like, I'm never going to touch electronics and the exact opposite happened. Why? Because someone told me, if you want to grow, you, you have to get uncomfortable. You're going to have to do mm. something you're not comfortable with, that you're not familiar with. You're just going to have to do it. Because if you don't do it, somebody else will. So that's why, you know, I opened up to, the, to uh, taking on engineering work. Mm. So I have the right partner to manage the electrical engineering and firmware and software. And so that's how that's how things worked out. Yeah, I good. think you just you just have to be open for something new and for mm -hmm. something that you're not familiar with. There's yeah. nothing wrong with that. Let's not forget Steve Jobs was also not an engineer. Mm. Right? So he did well for himself. Um, so are many other entrepreneurs. They're also not an expert in their field, but they do a fantastic job. So it's it's all about the people you work with. It's kind of like that old saying as well. Like you, um, you never stay at a workplace longer than you're not learning anything. Like you know, mm -hmm. you you've you've obviously got to a point where you've probably made maybe got to a comfortable aspect where you're pretty confident in your skills and you've continued to push yourself out of your boundaries until you you know come to a point where you've ended up in a maybe far from what you saw originally. And it's probably because you've continued to push yourself, um, to take risks and you know do things that are outside your comfort zone. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I've never awesome. would have imagined that uh, electric engineering is really, uh, yeah. it's really complicated. Yeah, it's uh, mm. the supply chain, getting things to work. Uh, it's not as easy as everyone thinks it is. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe think, moving back to your time in Europe, you've obviously moved from you know European design culture and even just general social culture into um, like Asian design culture and social culture. How has that move and, um, you know, how has that changed your perspective on design as well? Uh, so, okay. So when I moved to Shanghai in uh, 2007, mm. the way, okay, they, they designed for manufacturing on day one. There's very little conceptual design. And if there is, it's maybe just one, two people out of a design group of 50 people that are doing that. So the ID designers, they're very focused on designing it so it can get to production. So mm. just to give you an example of how efficient that is. Uh, when, when, so when I was doing the mobile phones, we had, a, we had a guy in the office, I called him Mr. Photoshop because he was so good at Photoshop. It was incredible. Mm. He, he would come into work, let's say nine-ish. He would sleep an hour, wake up at 10. And by noontime, he had all the renderings done in Photoshop. And in the afternoon, they were already on the table with their uh, mechanical engineer. And by the end of the week, they already had everything done. The mechanical engineering, including all the electrical components for that phone. Two well, weeks later, they already had a working sample on the table, just mock-up material, not production material. So yeah. they're very, they move very fast. It depends on, on, on the industry. Mm. But back then, the mobile phone business was moving extremely fast. They had, for example, they had injection molding machines in Shenzhen reserved for them only. So nobody mm. was allowed to touch these machines. They were only there to serve this one customer. Well, um, so the ID, I thought they were always very strong in um, color, material, and finishes. And that's because in Asia, you're very close to your supplier and they, mm. they're also experimenting with stuff. So it's like really quick and easy access. To, to, to find something interesting. Whereas in yeah. Europe, I thought that was kind of slow. We were always kind mm. of like looking for things, you know, walk, you know, take a walk through town and then take a picture of something we saw that, oh, what's that? And, you know, just mm. show everyone to uh, in the office. Whereas in Asia, it's like all over the place. Yeah. So okay. that was a big, that was a big difference. And yeah, just the work pace was extremely fast. It was too fast mm. for me, to be honest. And I didn't like it. Um, I think creativity needs time. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah. And yeah, it was just too fast. It was mm. too fast, but it works. It it works for their business model. So yeah, I can't criticize it too much. Mm. 
it's a hard balance to struck the balance between like spending a lot of time on a project versus like you know running through it because if you spend too much time on the project you know it becomes non-profitable at that point um and also i suppose the design process the problem is like you can't necessarily set a time on how long it would take to come up with a great design because it depends on you know a lot of different factors like who you're working with or you know when they, when you get that amazing idea um so i suppose the issue is like I've noticed that even in previous jobs, like they'll set a time period, like this has to be done in four hours. And it's mm -hmm. like, well, four hours, like the quality of the the outcome might not be great because you've only had four hours to do it. Um, right. And if, if you want a great outcome, you have to invest more time in a great solution kind of thing. Um, so I suppose it is a bit of a trade-off, but it seems like I'm trying to think maybe more like in-house teams have more, from my experience, in-house teams have more time to be able to invest in a great solution because the mm -hmm. company's kind of like paying you more salary. Whereas a lot of the consultancies, they kind of, um, you know, they're on the, they're on the hour, they're getting paid by the hour kind of thing. So they have to only work with the time they have to, to produce a great solution. Um, so I suppose in a way it kind of promotes you to work faster and, you know, greater, get a greater solution in that time period. Yeah. yeah. yeah another advantage here in Asia is um, if you're working for a bigger company, you have quick and you have quick access to new solutions. Let's say for a keyboard solution for a notebook, Mm. you know one morning you might be at work and they come someone will come to the office saying hey look we have this new kind of mechanical keyboard you want to test it and it just gives you new ideas for new products or new mm. applications for an existing product so that's something i really appreciate here is the also the suppliers adding their value to uh, product development yeah yeah okay um how do you think your time in asia has changed your de design philosophy overall if if at all uh, it's changed a lot. So I'm not, I used to be very focused on styling, mm, okay. like what, what a product should uh, look like. I've kind of gotten away from that. Um, I let other people do that these days mm. um, because getting a product to actually function and work and survive over a certain period of time, that is a huge mm. challenge. So making yeah. a new product is extremely difficult. So at our company here, we work on like next gen products, things that haven't mm. been done before. So we don't we don't do mobile phones, uh, rarely do notebooks, but we work on products that are brand new to, to the market. So there's a lot of prototyping involved, a lot of testing. Yep. Even after we do all that testing and prototyping and we do a small batch run, even then we get feedback from early beta testers. Hey, this is not good, this has to improve. So mm. we, we also don't know everything and we also don't know how the market is going to react. Mm. Uh, that's what we do. That's what I focus on. And that's, uh, yeah, it's a great challenge. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you usually take your um, projects and also clients that come on board for manufacturing? Do they usually pay you like for the job or do you sometimes take royalties and you know operate under that kind of um, model? Uh, we take royalties. Of course we have yep. a okay. fixed, uh, uh, NRE yep. um, system and uh, if you develop with us we manufacture yep it, okay. it's that simple yeah yep yeah okay it's because, interesting the balance yeah. yeah the thing is if you get rid of your development team and you go mm. manufacture somewhere else good luck because there's a lot yep. of knowledge that's going to get lost because our engineers always know something mm. you know know what's going on with the product with components so you can change your manufacturer once your product is a little bit more uh, mature. Yep. Still then, it's still a challenge. But if you're an early uh, ha uh, ha uh, hardware startup, that's like, uh, it's suicide. If you think mm. you can develop and then just go manufacture some somewhere, it's not possible. Mm. Yeah. Well, I suppose all that knowledge in the product development stage has kind of been contained in that team. We have yep. the same issues at my work. We outsource a lot of, our work that we just don't have the time for more more like rendering and things like that we outsource a lot of that um especially when it's like mass rendering that isn't like a one-off mm -hmm. nice render it'll be just like bulk rendering of products we'll outsource that and a lot of the time we have issues because the you know the people in these in these other countries that are re like rendering for us or even the people within australia they don't understand our products they don't understand like you know the different use cases and stuff like that so it can become a bit of a challenge and i can see how that definitely would be a benefit of you know keeping it all in what in-house in the same team yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
how do you integrate a successful design process with your manufacturing process? Because obviously, you know, you're all you're all in house, you're all in the same team. Um, how do you successfully integrate those two teams together? Uh, so we uh, design for manufacturing. So at an early stage, yep. we already work with our main suppliers mm -hmm. uh, to get the design right. Um, but it depends on the product. So sometimes we have, we have to do an early proof of concept. So there's actually no initial industrial design. It's just, um, you know, bare bone electronics. Mm -hmm. And we're just testing, does this even work? Okay. Yeah. So if it works, then we'll go to the design stage and, and then we'll start miniaturizing the electronics. We'll start working with industrial design, mechanical engineering, and the major suppliers. To, to get the product the way it should be. Okay. So the earlier you, you engage with your suppliers, the better, because they also have knowledge of their components, what's good, what's bad. So the earlier you can get them on board, uh, the better. Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, how has technolo technology development influenced your manufacturing capabilities um, and process in the past few years? And how do you see it influencing the future of your capabilities? For manufacturing? Yeah, for manufacturing. Or well, even design as well, whatever whatever you'd like to talk to. Yeah, so our, our manufacturing is, is very simple, straightforward. We work with yep. external suppliers for injection molding, yep. uh, SMT, uh, and then we assemble everything. Yep. So there's no, we don't have automation at our facility. Yeah, okay. Automation is yep. usually for, for the big guys. Yeah. For industrial design, I can't say much uh, because mm -hmm. I don't work as an industrial designer anymore. Yep. Um, but in terms of new technologies, like I mentioned uh, earlier on when we talked, I do find that AI is interesting mm, yeah. for industrial design. And I have to add, AI is also being used in manufacturing for co uh, quality mm. checks. So yep. I have a camera set up somewhere and it can detect, hey, this screw is misplaced or something is not aligned or glue is missing whatever it is. So I think AI is definitely the future for, for both industrial design and manufacturing. Um, but I do find it interesting for in, industrial design. We're at a point where we're saying, okay, AI is a helper for industrial design, right? Mm. I think looking into the future, I think maybe we don't need a designer anymore. Mm. I know a lot of are going to say no that's impossible you still need some human uh coordination but some of the th things that i've seen are so good they're still controlled mm. by human uh but the results are just really really amazing and quick mm. so the same thing can be applied not just for industrial design but also for mechanical engineering and i've already seen some software for electrical engineering where they will uh, where the ai will do your board layout mm. so i think at some point maybe that will all merge together and yes you as a human have to you have to do the input of what you want and then you choose and then you go manufacture could mm. happen we it's have to wait and maybe the manufacturing process and supplier choice might be automated as well mm. so once you have your design ready the ai will tell you hey you can source this part from this supplier at that cost so you're not hanging on the phone anymore asking, hey, do you have this? How much does it cost? Hey, how much is my tooling? Maybe everything will be automated in the future. Mm. Yeah. It's funny. I've had, I don't know, 10 people, maybe more on this podcast. And who've, we've probably spoken about design, about um, AI. And I feel like you're the first person who said that, <laughs> um, like who's, who's argued that we're not going to have a job in the future. Well, not have a job, but like the, the practices of ID will be taken over. Um, and to be honest, I actually, I actually feel like I'm on that side too. Like, I don't think I've actually mentioned my opinion, but I think I'm kind of on that side too. Just because of the rate of AI, like I think it's narrow-minded to not believe that there's a possibility at least that that could happen. Do you know what I mean? Because there's just, the yeah. rate of acceleration is just like unprecedented. So yeah, I'm not saying you know, it's going to happen yeah. soon, but maybe yeah. like in 10, 15 years. Yeah. What does industrial design actually look like? Well, maybe it's going to be different. Maybe we're just mm. coordinating a look and feel and a, and a brand. Maybe that's our job. I'm, yeah. I don't know. But I've seen some really great work. I, there's a guy on LinkedIn who does a lot of AI work. I forgot his name. He sells courses online. The stuff that he does is just really amazing. And I think he yeah. also used AI to create like an AI brand. 
and it was just awesome. It was like mm. really. Yeah, I feel like, at least in the short term, like you know, in the in the coming years, the the concept of what an industrial designer will be will probably just change. Um, like for example, you know, I, it even is kind of like this now. Like when when you talk to someone on the street, and if they have a concept of what an industrial designer is, they'll probably just think it's someone who makes things look nice, like from an aesthetic appearance, right. but realistically that's like a pretty narrow idea of what an industrial designer is like as you would know like the job can be much more broad than that if anything it's probably more focused on you know usability functionality like testing like preparing for manufacturing all these kind of things probably aesthetics to most people is probably not as important or not not like their majority job anyway um but obviously it depends on the that's the thing about industrial design as well it's so broad you can work for a consultancy that just does aesthetics you can work for a manufacturing company directly you know um, so I feel like with AI, it's probably just initially going to take over some of the roles of industrial design, Like maybe they will take over the aesthetic component, which is what it seems like at the moment where they're doing these beautiful, you know, product renders and all this stuff takes over that component of it. But the industrial designer still directs like creative, still has the creative direction and maybe even like coming up with innovative ideas that think a bit more outside of the box of like what a, mm. um, like a more generative AI will come up with. What are your thoughts? Yeah. So um, generative AI, yeah, it's still, I think it's still early mm. in, in the sense that uh, industrial design is going to get killed. Um, yep. But let me, go, let me go back a little bit. So when I was studying uh, industrial design early 2000, right, I think that's when Photoshop started um, becoming a little bit bigger. So I remember when I went to the university, there were some students like, oh, my God, Photoshop, it's going to, you know, it's going to take our work away. Because back then we were all sketching, you know, by hand. Mm. And I think at my university, it was maybe one guy, one or two guys that were able to use Photoshop in, in somewhat of a good way. Not, mm. not in a way that you see today, because Photoshop was also not as advanced as it is today. But back then, there was already some, you know, complaining, ah, Photoshop and CAD. CAD was another <laughs> thing. And that was also the beginning of 3D printing. And that was, like, mm. super expensive back then. So there was already, like, you know, some some people saying, oh, it's going to take our job away. But at the end of the day, it didn't. It enhanced mm. everything. It, it sped up the process. And I think AI is going to do the same thing. It's going to speed things up. But AI is a little bit different. So I, I do think maybe down, down the road in 10, 15 years, yeah, I think in the industrial design is going to change in, in, in mm. some way or other. It's the same as for mechanical engineering or any other engineering job. It's going to change. Mm. Yeah, well, I see the difference as being the automotive side of it because, you mm -hmm. know, like Photoshop, CAD, all these things, it just kind of gave us more tools to do better if, if anything or to you know do things at greater capacity than before but ai actually has the capacity to you know automate our jobs and like almost not think in it the way a human does but at least like work through processes in the way a human does which is actually yeah. could take our job in that way so i think yeah. like the idea where people are like oh cad didn't take our job or oh, like um you photoshop didn't take our job or other things i think it's a very different situation with ai to be honest yeah. And um, I think, yeah. Mm. What else can I add to that? Um, I also think like, you know, the process of mock-up making in the old days, we did everything by hand using foam mm. or whatever material we could get our hands on. And uh, we have a form lapse printer here at the office. Yeah, that awesome. and what that thing does is absolutely mm. amazing. It's not taking my job away. It, it's yep. quite the opposite. It's making me money because yeah. I can <laughs> We actually build all our testing jigs with our 3D printer. So we're not using a, a third party to buy things or manufacture things. We we do it in-house. And so for some products, we actually make small parts here. Mm. So 3D printing is also, well, it's not AI, but it's just an example of how technology can help you. Mm. But generative AI you know, spitting out design. I think right now it's a little bit early because I do see a lot of um, plagiarism in some of the design. So I can, I do mm -hmm. recognize, hey, this is the AI copied this, you know, yeah. from, from this source. So some AI is like, is, is like a really good internet scraper. Um, so for example, I use an AI program for uh, making music. So you can basically type in what kind of music you want. You can even throw in your own lyrics and the AI will start composing music for you. 
but it does sound very very familiar to what's uh you know already popular on the radio or yeah it's just regurgitating it ultimately yeah right right so that i do see a little bit of an issue at the moment but i think in the future it's just gonna it's gonna get better and better i'm trying to find this video that we could quickly watch um i was watching this video today i'll just quickly try and get it up and it's just about the um movement into um generative a generative ai in, in car manufacturing um mm -hmm. and using like so obviously you also kind of come from a bit of a manufacturing side of things um which is interesting and yeah, this is using like generative AI for not just the the frame and things like that, which has been done in the past, but even like brake calipers and all sorts of crazy things. Um, I might just bring it up quickly. I haven't done this before actually, but sure. I thought it might be nice to have a, have a watch through it. Sorry for anyone who's watching this, who's, who's in a car driving along, they're not going to be able to see the video, but we'll have a quick look at it. Um, we'll just bring it up. Whoa. Share screen. Um, Sure. Can you see that? Yep. Awesome. Yeah, check this out. So this is like, it's a new supercar they're building. So which company is this? Sorry? Which which company is doing this? This is um Kaiser Vehicles. I think it's a German company. Um, twenty one C. It's like a new supercar they're building. It's pretty. I haven't heard of the company before. I just saw this video today, but I thought it was amazing. Like, look at the the detail they're doing. Yeah, yeah, very yeah. organic. Hmm. But you'll see in the video. Oh, yeah, it goes on anyway, but basically through that, they've managed to cut 25% off the highest quality castings in the world, 25% uh, wow. weight, which yeah. is crazy. Like it's just insane. And also it's also, I think safer than a normal supercar because the way this chassis is designed with like 3D printing, they're able to design it specifically to take impact, um, it, like directionally, which is crazy. Um, have you like, have you seen stuff like this coming up and like, do you think this is going to be the future of like engineering and things like that where you know, AI systems will take over the more generative side of AI? Oh, for sure. For sure. I mm. think especially for, for ID and engineering, I think it, it will uh, take a lot of the thinking away. Yeah. Uh, from mechanical engineering, it's probably like structural stuff. Let's say if we think of consumer electronics, let's think of plastic parts. Yeah. Do we need human input to make all the ribs and, you know, all the details? No, maybe AI can do it. And if so, it's even better. It's just going to accelerate things. So I don't, I don't see anything uh, bad with it, but I've never seen that for cars. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a recent thing. I think like it's still relatively new, um, but I think it's something that's probably going to come up more in the coming years. We'll just trying to yeah, close this. Yeah. I've also seen um, AI for app development where the AI will spit out your app and, and your style and then you yeah. can modify it from there. I think that's quite interesting as well. Mm, yeah. Um, what are some specific challenges for designing manufacturing for consumer electronics that you've felt and um, maybe some advice that you can give to others looking to join the space? Good question. Um, okay, let me focus that question on hardware startup mm. founders. Uh, the challenge is always cost. So in order to achieve a certain cost, you need high volume to get that component cost lower. So the biggest challenge is cost. And the other one is time. Uh, so when you're developing a product, you'll have a setback uh, no matter what. No matter what you're making, your schedule is always a, be a best estimation. It can never be accurate unless you're making something that's been done for 20 years, like a computer notebook. That's more predictable. But if you're doing something new, um, you're just going to have to anticipate delays, uh, a lot of design changes, and cost. So what we suggest with a very early um, startups is to start off with a product architecture phase, do some study. What do you actually need for this product? And then do some rough cost uh, calculation. And then mm. you can, you'll have an uh, a good uh, estimation from low to high. 
and then kick off your project. Don't kick off your project as making assumptions. So a lot of hardware startups, when they kick off, they already assume, oh, my product's going to cost $20 in manufacturing. And then when they finish, it costs 60 and their assumptions are based off going on Alibaba, looking at something similar and mm. just guessing. But that's because they're non-technical. So I would never do any assumptions. I would really talk to a professional company and uh, pay for some research up front, some product architecture, mm. some study. Um, that helps. That helps to minimize risk. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. How do you collaborate with software and hardware developers to execute a cohesive package? Because obviously you have you know, engineers and um, you know, mechanical and and also electronic and then designers and then manufacturers and then all these different parties all coming together to create a successful product. How do you leverage that um, towards a successful outcome? Yeah, so our, our software development is actually quite simple, straightforward. Mm -hmm. So we help our hardware startups um, connect their hardware device to a backend like an Amazon server. And we help them translate that data into something visual on their app. And that's basically, that's it. Um, so we do it in-house. Now, the reason why we brought this in-house is because we've worked with many hardware startups um, from Europe or from, from the US. And what happens is they find a company for app development and they start subcontracting that work. Mm. And now there's nothing wrong with subcontracting, but it has to be controlled. It has to be managed. And we found out it's not managed well. Uh, we lose time because of different time zones, uh, lack of communication. So we decided to bring it in-house. So our software guy can directly talk with our electric engineering guy if there's a problem. So we're not wasting any time. And it, so far, it's paid off. Mm. Okay. So we awesome. try to give our customer the full package um just so we save time okay um how have you moved from working in your own practice to expanding into um you know your own your own company and what challenges have you felt in that expansion and you know obviously you seem to have expanded in very rapidly like to put 20 employees over only a few years um you know what yeah what challenges have you felt with that and also what opportunities have you felt when growing so rapidly mm. I think the biggest challenge uh, when developing a new product it, are timelines. It's the mm. schedule because we can only make best estimations. And um, it is a challenge because, you know, sometimes we develop something, we build a prototype, and then we find out this is not going to work. And in order to fix that problem, we're going to have to add another three, four weeks to the schedule mm. until we get a new sample. And then we get the new sample. So the iteration process is really, really time consuming. And it's a challenge financially also because we also have to finish our work so things don't pile up. That is that is a, that is a huge challenge. And then manufacturing mm. is a different story. There are a lot of di different challenges on, on the manufacturing side than on the uh, R&D side. Yep. Uh, ske schedule is really, really hard. And I have to say, so hardware startup founders, they have a different thinking of what a schedule is compared to an engineer. So an engineer's schedule is always the best estimation, right? For a founder, non-technical founder, if you tell them, yes, we're going to have a sample ready end of September, they're going to hold you on that. End of September, it's ready, and I'm going to market on, you know, December, whatever. Uh, but that's just not how engineers think. Um, mm. So there's a little bit of a disconnection between uh, engineering teams and uh, founders. Mm. Well, I suppose they don't understand necessarily that manufacturing isn't always like a linear process. And there can be a lot of the time like hiccups along the ways or even just like innovations that you have to make that take time. Um, I suppose that comes down to just having like realistic expectations as a founder as well. <laughs> right, right. So it's um, it's hard because some found, some founders are open to, to learning mm. and understanding. Other founders are just, uh, they don't want to listen. They want to do things their way. And from our experiences, those founders that want to do it their way, they usually fail. Mm, yeah. Because you, you cannot force a product into life just because you want it to. Certain mm. steps have to be made. And, um, you know, 
founders always talk about Apple, okay? Well, Apple does it. Apple does it like this. I want to do it like this. But Apple is on a whole different level than anyone yeah. else. And yeah. um, even when you look, Apple also has struggles. It's not like they don't have problems in manufacturing or development. They also mm. struggle just like everyone else. It's just that no one talks about it. Some people know know things internally, what's going on. Mm. So I think recently there was another startup called Humane, the AI pin. Those were also former Apple employees. And they, they also had to go through the same struggle every other hardware startup has to go through. Go mm. through. So they had problems with their uh, battery management. They had problems with connectivity, I think. And they had some issues with their firmware. Mm. Now, that, that doesn't mean their engineering is bad. It just means it takes time. It yeah. really takes time to get things smooth, smoothed out. And then you can ramp up. It just takes time. Mm. Yeah, it's amazing. From my perspective, I mean, living over here in Australia, I've, I haven't worked in consumer electronics. It seems like almost an impossible task to create a product, an electronic product and bring it to life. So it's really amazing that you guys are, you know, daily, well, I don't know about daily, but regularly bringing these products to life and, you know, having successful outcomes as well. Yeah. That's extremely difficult. Uh, people mm. underestimate it. If you yeah. think about it, you have industrial designers, mechanical engineers, electric engineers, firmware, mm. software, procurement, program management. There's so many things coming together, packaging design, okay? Mm. Then you have to go through regulations, certifications. It's just never ending. So, yeah. so you, you do need someone to manage all of this and have a good understanding of what's needed to get to the finish line. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And uh, also overcome. You also need someone who understands how to overcome certain challenges. Most of the most of the challenges are communication issues. Most of the time. Mm. Um. To move on from that, what are your what's your perspective on manufacturing in Asia? Obviously, in the past what twenty years, China's had an absolute you know, has absolutely dominated the market, and they've just absolutely like skyrocketed in growth in the country. I haven't been to to China personally, but I've always wanted to go, and I've heard that it's just insane the growth um, over like even the last twenty years. Um, but that seems to be like not changing, but other players seem to be coming into mm -hmm. the field. Um, what do you see? Like, I know we, we currently manufacture in India and other places as well. Um, but I, like, I think only 10 years ago, we only manufactured in China. So what are your thoughts on the next like 20, 10, 20 years? And do you think that potentially other Asian, um, you know, players will become the same scale as China? Yeah. Hard to say. So, um, okay. First of all, I love working in, uh, China for manufacturing. It's mm. great. Um, but you know, there are political tensions between the U S uh, even Europe, yep. China. So, so many manufacturers have left. So they're either in Thailand, Vietnam, but here's the problem. You still need the components and those components mm -hmm. come out of China. So Thailand and Vietnam, I think they also have issues with raw material. Mm -hmm. So even if you, um, want to manufacture in Thailand, for, for example, where, where, where are your displays coming from? They're probably mm -hmm. coming from China. Where's your battery coming from? Probably from China. And to achieve a certain cost, where are you getting your electronic components? Probably from China. So a lot of companies, they moved out of China. Even Chinese mm -hmm. companies moved out of China. But they're still importing the components to get things assembled. So they basically just moved assembly to another yeah. country. So, But I do think it's good that um, it's spreading out a little bit because I think the world just put all its eggs into one basket. Mm, and yeah. China because it was cheap and a lot of people got filthy rich over the last 25 years because China was so cheap, uh, but politics are changing and um, things are spreading. And I think that's actually a good thing. Mm. Uh, just take batteries. Uh, China is unbeatable in batteries. Uh, you cannot, yeah, sure. You could source batteries maybe from Thailand, but they're relabeled. They're made, they're made in China. <laughs> so I, th I think we have to spread out a little bit just to keep things, uh, you know, safe. We shouldn't rely mm. on just one one country to do everything for us. It's also just good for business as well to have competition. You know, like yeah. it's never good when there's just one power that has all the all the you know power and influence as well. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So, and I think China is also facing some challenges. So, I think like twenty years ago, you know, 
factories had no problem getting workers. There, there, there was just enough. But that generation now is older. So, they, mm -hmm. you know, they retired. And the new generation, they don't want to do this work. So I think what, what I've heard is, is that a lot of manufacturing is uh, up north in China. So the government actually relocates certain companies to go north to make yeah, those to, to make those cities that are developing to keep them busy. So mm. Shenzhen, the first time I traveled to Shenzhen, there was basically nothing there. They were like, really? uh, two, yeah, it was, wow. it, it was, there's not much. There were like three tall buildings. That was it. In Shenzhen, and, wow. Yeah, wow. and Shenzhen grew really, it grew really fast. Mm. But now it's also super expensive. Mm. The younger generation doesn't want to do that job anymore. So yeah, some smaller factories are struggling. That's just how it is. Yeah. Okay. Um. Obviously, you operate as sort of the business. Are you the CEO? I'm guessing CEO of the company to right. some degree. Yeah, CEO. Um, and then also you operate on more of a you know interpersonal um area where you do a bit of what design work and also engineering as well. Um, how do you balance that kind of business side of your job versus the more practical um on the on the ground kind of side of it? And how do you successfully make sure you manage the company as well as you know create a great outcome? Yeah, so I don't do any design work. Uh, okay. Yep. Not, not much. So we hire designers if we yep. need them. Yep. And I'll just, uh, you know, have a look at the outcomes and discuss. Um, but basically my job, how should I describe this? It's, um, okay, a lot of people don't believe this. We work about six days a week, sometimes mm. seven days a week, um, usually up to 18 hours a day. And that's because well, we have overseas clients. So mm. that doesn't mean we're working constantly, you know, 18 hours. It means our mornings are busy and then late afternoon it gets quiet, but then our evenings are super busy. Mm. So it's not unusual that we're at the office until 2 a.m. in the morning. That's actually quite quite standard. Well, But that is just how it is if you have oversee uh, customers. So is there work-life balance? Uh, not really. Um do I care? No, because I like doing what I'm doing. Keeps yeah. me happy. Um, even, you know, sometimes when I take five days off, let's say small vacation, mm. I just don't know what to do. I just, yeah. I just like being here. I just like mm. making things and um, keeping the business running. Uh, running an engineering firm and manufacturing is extremely time consuming. It needs mm. a lot of human uh, resource. Yeah. Do you have a family? Yes. Yes, yeah, I have okay. one. Do you struggle to to make meet a balance between like your work life with your with your child as well? No, not at all. It's it's actually okay. quite good. So um, it's good in Taiwan. So school days in Taiwan are actually quite long. So it starts somewhere at like uh, seven a.m. So school school starts usually at seven thirty a.m. Yeah. Okay. And then by the time she's done with school and homework and all that stuff, it's probably seven p.m. So that's yep. a good time for me to jump back home, yep. spend some time, you know, finish up whatever has to be finished up. And then usually after 10 p.m., I'm busy on uh, doing phone calls and meetings. Sometimes I'll rush back to the office if needed. Yep. Um, yeah, that's that's how it is. Ta Taiwan lifestyle is a little bit different than the rest mm. of the world. So people work long hours here. And yep. it, it is because your customers are abroad and you have to accommodate mm. that time. Yeah. So keep, yeah, I heard. Keep, yeah, I heard the um lifestyle in Asia can be very different too. Well, especially in Australia, our lifestyle is very laid back in Australia. Like we're we're lucky in some ways, but I think there is a trade off. Um, because yeah. there is probably like a there there isn't as much of a work ethic. Um, in some ways compared to the like you know countries in Asia, like it's hard to find good quality workers who want to work hard just because our culture kind of rewards you for having a relaxed lifestyle, which doesn't necessarily pair up with like a hardworking um, career, I feel like in some ways. Um, and I suppose, but I feel like it is changing in some ways um, as, as Australia becomes more prominent on like the world scale, but definitely like I've noticed as well in my career that there has been, um, yeah, like I even talked to my boss, like he, we have manufacturing in China and he said like the people in China just work crazy. Like things just get done so quickly and they yeah. they'll work like, you know, overnight if they have to, to get it done. Um, whereas the work ethic in Australia is just, it's just different. Like, you know, you get closer to six o'clock at night and you go home. Like, that's just how it is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I suppose it's, it is a trade-off and 
it just depends what kind of lifestyle you're looking to live, I suppose. Yeah. All right. But, so we all don't, we we also don't feel bad about working. Yeah. Like this. That's it's, the thing. It's uh, part of it's part of life, part of the culture. Yeah. 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 So it's it's funny, you know. I because I I worked in Europe for a long time. Mm, yeah. Even doing some odd jobs, and now when I work, let's say with a German customer. I'm actually quite annoyed because they're always on vacation. It's like every six, <laughs> every six to eight weeks out of office email for five days out of office <laughs> holiday here. I'm like, we're never going to finish like this. If you're an entrepreneur, if you, if you have a mm. hardware startup and you're, you're based in U S or, or in Europe, you, you have to hustle. You, mm. you can't do your six weeks holiday in the summer. You're <laughs> skiing, you skiing trips in winter. Forget about it. You you really yeah. have to work, especially when you're yeah. building a product. You can't be on on vacation every other week. Mm. So we've noticed that, and then sometimes I'll have a chat with them and say, "Hey, you know, maybe you can push out your vacation. Let's get this done." Yeah. So yeah, sometimes <laughs> it works, sometimes it doesn't. So yeah. And what um, and what I also do is what I also do is I invite them to come to Taiwan. Mm. They they can stay in our office. Uh, they can co-work with us. So we do work with some hardware uh, startups. They have their own in-house uh, engineering teams and they'll come to Taipei. And that is like really great because mm. communication is so much smoother and cleaner and things get done. Yeah. So working, you know, let's say if someone is in San Francisco, that's, we have a 15 hour time difference to San, to San Francisco. That's quite painful, mm. uh, especially for the late night uh, phone calls. But having it here in Taipei, when they come, it it's just it speeds things up greatly. Mm, yeah, yeah, we're lucky. We're on pretty much what only two hour time difference, which is pretty good, really. Yeah, um, close to Australia. Um, you you used to work as an academic as well in your career. You've had a bit of a broad career. You've moved around. Yeah. Um, how does your academic career? How has that you know influenced your your life as a designer as well as you know a business owner? No, it didn't influence anything. So I was just yep. teaching industrial design for um, uh, fresh first year students. Yep. That was kind of uh, it was very relaxing, not stressful at all because mm. uh, because you're 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 teaching to a group of people that have no clue about product design or development. Yep. So for them, a product is just there because it exists. They really <laughs> don't they don't have a sense yet of purpose. Uh, what is the product trying to solve so mm. it was it was it sometimes yeah it was good to teach because it also reminded me of bringing a purpose to a product we just have too many products these days that serve no purpose it's just like mm. there's just too much stuff out on the market that's just crap yeah so uh yeah it also made me rethink hey what what are what are we really designing here what are we making is this for the landfill mm. or is this really helping someone with something yeah so like i said before early in my career i was doing a lot of styling mm. and now i'm at a point where i look for pur purpose in in the product mm. so if we can do something that helps someone um that's great so we do a lot of health tech uh wearables and I love working on those projects because they're very early stage. And I know mm. the purpose, you know, down the road, five, 10 years from now is going to be really good because all these devices now are collecting data and all that data gets put into another development in the future. So things become better and better. Mm. A good yeah, example going back is, to, so yeah, continue. Oh, uh, sorry. A good example is the Apple watch wearables. I, I, uh, do you remember when the Fitbit came out? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so I remember when when wearables started coming up, Fitbit I think was one of the first companies to do uh, tracking steps. And I remember meeting someone, and that person told me wearables are garbage; they're not going to survive. But my mindset was different. I was already thinking, no, the wearable is going to be the future. Uh, it's going to be your future doctor. I wasn't mm -hmm. even thinking about the steps anymore. Now the Apple Watch, I think, is a sleeping giant. I think once the Apple Watch has like AI integration and once sensor technology becomes better to get better uh, data from your body, you don't need a doctor anymore. It's on your wrist and mm. you need medication. You just push a button. So Apple is probably going to get into the medication business at some point or get their shares from, from the sales. 
Mm. I think wearables have come such a long way. And there were a lot of haters in the beginning. Uh, counting your steps is stupid. And what, what do you need? Your heart is beating anyway. Why do you need to know? But you have to look 10 years, 20 years into the future mm. to understand what's going on. Uh, so I think the Apple Watch is, uh, I think it's a sleeping giant just ready yeah. to uh, to explode, just to wake up. Yeah, okay. Um, going back to the sort of sustainability aspect of it, how do you, you know, differentiate what is a good product that you want to pursue? Like, do you, is that is that something in your process? Like, you won't necessarily take on a project if you feel like it is just a pointless pro product that's going to end up in landfill, or is it more that you will take on the project but then try and do it in a more sustainable way? No, we don't take it. If we think this okay. is it, this is not good, we don't do it because um, we like to, we ha we have to manufacture to sustain ourselves. Yep. So if, if someone comes to us with a product and we see no potential, we don't mm. do it, no matter how yep. much they, they're willing to pay us. So we we have turned down projects in a very, very high range and said, no, mm. we can't do it. Yeah, it's good money uh, to keep you know our guys busy, but is it is it for the future? No. Yep. So yeah, no, it's can no you, problem. Can you give me an example? Example of a project like that that you knocked back? Mm. Like can't without do... leave, obviously exposing anything, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh no i can't because i'm under nda um, yeah okay yep it's not it's, yeah some 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 projects were in the medical field yep okay um let's say robotics mm. and we were like no they said this has no potential like yeah okay it, it takes a lot for my team to say no let's yeah. not do this this is this is a high risk because we'll be developing forever that's mm. one thing and the second thing is we're not going to manufacture a lot of these and it's not going to help anyone. We're not really solving mm. an issue. But what we've been doing um, for a couple of years is we do, we do check on like what kind of materials we're using in, in our process, especially for packaging design. We like to keep things uh, simple mm. and uh, we definitely don't work with anything that's like environmentally uh, bad. Yep. Okay. And we do a lot of, um, Design for repairability. Mm. We have customers, their products are B2B devices. They do need to be refurbished, repaired, so they can go back into the field. So we do design for repairability. That means after one, two years, they send us the units back, let's say 500, 1,000 pieces, and we fix them in one, two days, and we ship them back. So that's something we like to do. Mm. And that's, that's also a big topic in Europe, I think, right now, is design for repairability. Yep. And I think in the U.S. as well. And, I, I, you know, Apple is always a good example. You can't mm. replace the batteries by yourself. Yeah. So I've heard they're working on something, apparently. Uh, but we'll see. What what ways have you um, kind of made your products more repairable? Like what specific hardware or software changes have you, yeah. have you contributed? So we, have, we have one uh, consumer electronics device. It's a B2B device. It has a 7-inch display. Yep. Our, even our customer is able to repair this product by himself. We've designed it in a way that you only have to release two screws and everything slides open nicely. You can take the display panel off. You can stick in a new one, connect okay. it to the CBA, put the screws back in. It's done. That simple. So we did that design without them knowing that it was repairable. And when they found mm. out it was repairable, they were like, they, they said, we didn't know... We, we could do this. And we're like, yeah, of course you can do this. Why would you want to throw it away? So it turns out that they were throwing their, they had, a, they had another product that they were using and their, that design was not repairable. It meant that they had to throw that product into the landfill. Mm. But when we did the redesign of their product, they were shocked to find out that it can be repaired. So uh, that, was, that was, that was a satisfying feeling, you know? Mm. Yeah, and it's good you guys, like, I feel like these days with sustainability, I almost don't like to talk about it these days because I feel like there is a very, um, I don't know, like political stigma around, like, you know, sustainability these days. And a lot of people talk about sustainability as in, like, they want to save the world, they want to do this, they want to do that. But then, like, 
unfortunately, a lot of time it's just not really realistic to be completely sustainable. Um, but the fact that you guys aren't even necessarily waiting for a client to tell you to be sustainable because they, you know, they want to get some sort of sticker on their website, right? You guys are just going ahead and making this, doing the steps automatically to make it more repairable and things like that, which to me is what I see as true sustainability. Like not necessarily mm. that every pro, every um, piece of the product is going to be made from natural resources, which is just unrealistic. Um, that you know you actually just take steps to make it serviceable and repairable, and you know, and that's to be honest, what a lot of older products had. Like that's more of a newer idea that they just aren't serviceable. Um, so it's really great that you guys are bringing that back again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, and it's a challenge. Not every pro we can't design every product like that, unfortunately, mm. but. If we can, we do it. And then we have a call with our customer and then we tell them, hey, by the way, we can design this in a way so you can fix it. You can either fix it at your location, whether that's in the US or in Europe, we'll send you the components to, to swap or you send it back to us and we'll fix it. Always depends on volume, of course. I mean, if if you're manufacturing something at like, let's say you have 1 million units mm -hmm. on, the on the market, yeah, you'll probably do the return process with us because you have to keep the labor costs cheap. But if we're yeah. talking about a couple of hundred units to repair, you might as well just do it at home. Yeah. Obviously you guys are a bit small, you're smaller scale. What's the smaller scale you guys manufacture? Oh, so, okay. So the way we manufacture is the following. If, we are, if we're doing a new product, our mm -hmm. manufacturing is uh, low volume first because we have to get the product mature. Once, you know, we smoothen out all the mistakes, the debugging in software or even on the assembly line will ramp up our production. So small volume for us is, um, let's say, 5,000 units. Yep. And we can handle higher volume all the way up to 250,000 units. But to be honest, most hardware startups don't achieve that volume. Yep. Okay. Why is that? They just don't have the funding behind them initially or it's a like funding, it's hard to sell that many? Uh, yeah. It's also market size. It's also mm. market, -based. but you don't need, you don't need necessarily, you don't necessarily need high volume to survive as a hardware startup. If you can do 5,000 units per month, you're in, you're mm. in good shape. You're in really yeah. good business. Yeah, um, okay. So I always say in the beginning, if you can do 500 units per month in your first year, you got something. Mm. Yeah, definitely. So 500, um, is like a low number, but uh, try to sell something per yeah. month. 500 units uh and it's something new it's not easy mm. uh, to move on from there you mentioned you're writing a book actually at the moment um oh, called right, co-pilot right. co yeah i'd like to hear more about that it's i don't think i've spoken to too many people that have wrote their own books um and i feel like it is an interesting thing because a lot of designers like they go through these long careers and have a lot of experience that they've built up but it's sometimes hard for them to you know find an outlet where they can express it um, mm -hmm. some of them, I've noticed a lot of designers moving to LinkedIn and places like that to express their knowledge, but it's, yeah, it's book, book writing is an interesting venture. Uh, why did you get into that? And what is this book about? Okay. So how did I get into it? I started preparing like PDF files for new customers that were non-technical to get, give them a better overview of what's going to happen in the next 12 months. Uh, so, you know, I've been refreshing that document all the time. Then I realized, Hey, why don't I just, uh, write a book? And so I went online, did some research, and I realized stuff that's out there is like, it's written by engineers for engineers. It's just boring mm. stuff that's yeah. very technical, <laughs> and nobody needs to know that, right? Mm. You, you don't need to know what problems BGA has. You don't need to know what kind of problems are on the SMT line. As, as a non-technical founder, you just don't need to know the details, but you should have mm. an overview of what's going on. So I started writing this book. And the, the first section of the book is basically about the disconnection between uh, non-technical hardware startup founders and engineering firms. There is mm. a huge disconnection with, because early startup founders or non-technical founders, they're focused on uh, marketing, sales, fundraising. Engineering teams are not focused on any of that. They're focused on developing. Mm. So. Founders usually have a lot of pressure with schedule and funding. Uh, so the first section is about the disconnection, okay? And how to improve this disconnection. And there's also a huge issue with communication. Like when engineer, engineers talk to non-technical founders, it's like talking with a wall. I mean, 
they understand none of your problems. All they hear is it's not working. Mm. But in from an engineering's an engineer's point of view, it's it's not failure. It's just okay. Now we know that this doesn't work, so let's move on to a new solution. It doesn't mean it's it failed, but for a non technical founder, it means failure. It's it's not going to work. So the first section is 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 called the disconnect. And the second section is about engineering. So I'll dive into mechanical engineering, electrical, firmware, software. And the way I'm doing the book is it's very visual. Since mm. I have a background in ID, it's more visual than it is written. So it's I'll have some visual and some writing. Hey, this is this, this is that. We'll talk about components. And I have a strong focus on uh, electrical engineering and that whole supply chain, like what is an IC? Where does it come from? Who makes it? How are they sold? You know, what is a PCB? What is a PCBA? What types are there? How are they made? And so uh, what problems can you expect during development? Mm. So I have a whole section of, of problems that potentially can come up when you develop a new product. And the last part of the book is 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 very visual. It's uh, more like terms, what terms are used uh, when you engineer, and some pictures of parts and components. Okay. So I think when it's done, it, it might be 200, 250 pages, something like that. Okay. But it it's will good, help. It's... Yeah, it will help. It's called Cold Pilot because it's uh, it should help you navigate through this space of understanding mm. And there's, of course, a section about industrial design as well, because yep. we do work with startups that are like industrial design. We don't need that. What for? It's just extra <laughs> cost. Just make yeah. it look. It's like um, we, we had this one guy once. He said, just go to Pinterest and uh, look what the other guys are doing and just copy that. <laughs> so we're like, no, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there seems to be a very like still to this day, there's this real issue in design where people don't really understand the benefit of it um mm -hmm. you've probably experienced this in your in your career as well and it like like when i came into this company i like i was hired as actually a drafter i wasn't even a designer at the time um and throughout me working there they realized that what i could do was what they wanted but they just didn't really realize at the time that that's what they wanted um so now my job titles changed and stuff like that um, and, you know, now I'm taking more of like a product design um, and product development you know, role as well as like sort of manufacturing and drafting as well, um, which has been interesting. But it is interesting, like me coming into the business, they don't even really know what it is. I've kind of like created the role in some ways. Um, and this is like a pretty big company that you think would know the benefit of it. But it's still to this day, there's just so many companies out there that don't really understand, you know, the use of yeah. industrial design and, and how what benefit it can bring to their business. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's really good that they have you. And uh, it's also a great challenge for you to 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 build that up within mm. a company. There are a lot of a lot of companies that are not design focused. They have they have product, and yes, it sells and it works, but it's not mm. really design oriented or user friendly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I feel like it is something that's changing. Like, there's like yeah, these big companies like Apple. Like Apple's just the big mm. one, but these massive companies that are definitely very product centric. They probably are changing the the wider world's perspective of like the benefit of having a more design centric company opposed to like only engineering centric company. Um, but even now, like it seems there's a lot of companies that are more software based as well, which is like a, kind of a new um, a new perspective on how to run a company. Like you can almost be limited in the design and engineering department to some degree, but more focused on the so the software aspect of the actual product. Um, is that have you seen companies come through that kind of have that more that the vision similar to that? No. Okay. We're really hardware focused. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. 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 Um, just to we're we're almost coming to the end, but just to get some final final things from you. Um, what is the most important skills that you see industrial designers and even engineers um needing to work on and develop in their careers to become successful? Uh, be open minded about doing something new. So I don't think like with me, for example, I didn't stick to in industrial design. I jumped into a world of uh, engineering. Um, you just need some courage to do something new, just venture out. I think um, 
industrial design is great, but I think if, let's say you're an independent industrial designer, why not offer engineering services? Why not offer mm. app development services? Uh, you don't have to be stuck with uh, 3D renderings, animation. Mm. You know, if that makes you happy, fine. You know, I know a handful of designers that are a hundred times better than me, but I could never do their job because it's so boring. They, they do their nine to five and they do it really, really good, really well. Mm. Uh, but I couldn't do it. It wouldn't make me happy. I have to wake up in the morning and I have to feel challenged. It's always mm. been like that for me. Um, so yeah, just be open-minded um, and, you know, just have the courage to do something different and something new. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Well, yeah, we might leave it there anyway. Thank you so much for coming on today, Boris. And it's, it's been really yeah, nice to get your perspective. So and maybe one day when I come to China, I can come visit and check out what you're doing there. <laughs> yeah, we're in Taiwan. So we're not in China. Oh, Taiwan, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> Taiwan. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we're oh, yeah. in the Republic of uh, China. This is what it's officially called. Yeah, okay. So at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll explain that when you're over here. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Thank you so much, Boris. Have a good one. Thank you so much. See you later. Have Thank a nice you, day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.